I'm Greg Stoller, and this is The Language of Business, now proudly broadcast on over 10 stations. Today, we'll discuss the business plan's organizational plan section, and in particular, how you go about building a strong management team, then measure the success. Step one is the industry and competitive analysis. You want to capitalize on an unmet opportunity in the marketplace. Step two, you create a new customer base or reach out to your existing customers with news of your innovative product or service. Step three, the organizational plan. At this point, the focus is on personnel, from the executive team all the way to the staff level. Investors prefer an A-rated management team to a B-rated venture idea. The rationale being the management team's value add is their ability to bob and weave in light of the market's changes by adjusting the strategic plan. Investors hope their chemistry will collectively bring forth a successful result. But unlike the profit and loss report, where you can objectively determine success or not, evaluating management talent is far more nebulous. Our first guest is John Murphy. He has a master's degree in accounting and is an associate at Point Judith Capital, where he supports the investment process and oversees investor reporting. A lot of his time is spent putting together a strong management team for his portfolio companies. John, welcome to the Language of Business. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for having me. So given your extensive background in financial analysis and reporting, how have you made the jump to being an associate at a venture capital firm? Yeah, so a quick background on myself. I started um, at Grant Thornton, which is one of the international public accounting firms, sure. uh, focused more on the middle market. And I was working with two different types of clients. I was working with early stage technology clients, and I was working with venture capital uh, clients, and in also private equity, but primarily venture capital. Um, and so I got to see both sides of the business. I got to see the you know, inner workings of an early stage technology company, and I also got to see the investor side. And when I was at Grant Thornton, one of the new pronouncements that came out was FAS 157. Sure. Um, and so I got very involved in business valuation and learning how to uh, approach business valuation from a gap reporting perspective. And so that was what kind of was my you know, and how many years ago was that? Uh, that was two years ago okay. that I left Grant Thornton to join Point Judith. Um, so I was at Grant Thornton for four years. Um, and you know, that skill set was something that allowed me to um, you know, get into Point Judith was they were looking for somebody that understood the reporting side sure, of business and valuation. You could, you could capitalize on what you were doing at Grant Thornton. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so, so I could use that skill set to add value to Point Judith, but also they were looking for somebody who um, you know, had some experience with early stage technology companies that was able to you know, come in and kind of learn the process of investing. So you've been at Point Judith now for two years. What is the composition of your team when making investment decisions? We're a fairly small firm. Uh, we have five employees. Yep. Uh, there's three general partners, myself, and uh, one additional person. And so every Monday we have an investment committee meeting that comprised of the three general partners and myself. Yep. Um, and making investment decisions is really a vote of the three general partners. They have you know equal ownership in the business. And um, you know there's a long process that comes to the point of making you know weeks and weeks of, of course, diligence of and course, things like yeah. that. Um, but the actual decision making is made at investment committee between the three partners, and you know I'm there to kind of support anything that of course. that goes on yeah. with that process. So today's segment is focused on the management team, and at what point in the investment process do you begin focusing on the team that you're assembling? I think that's probably one of the most important things about making an investment is who the team currently is and what they're looking at in terms of who they want to hire and. Um, you know, what their network looks like and, and who they can bring in. So I think it's a fundamental piece of the investment process. Is but does this happen at the beginning? Does this happen when you have had them do their dog and pony show initially? You know, what point have they presented to you two, three, four times that you start focusing on the management team? I think it's the first thing we focus on. Um, you know, if we meet with somebody that has a great idea and there's a really big market, but it's not a team that we think can execute, then it, we're never going to make that investment. Um, so it's it's right at the beginning, first time you meet with the CEO, you're evaluating them and their network and the management team. And, and how are you defining the management team? Is it just the CEO? Is it all C-level executives? Help us sort of figure out what goes into, from Point Judith's perspective, you know, discussing or evaluating the management team. Yeah, I think of the management team as not just the CEO, but CEO, CTO, chief revenue officer, yeah. you know, C-level, but also um, some VP level, depending on the company and what stage they're at. Okay. Um, so it's really the team that's going to be directing the strategy and the vision of the company. 
And when you go to review performance, at what point is the management team's evaluation considered either pre-investment or post-investment? Um, so it's it's an ongoing thing. Um, you know, it's not like a set time that we will get together and discuss metrics for the management team. It's the partners will take board seats on all the company's board of directors, um, and they'll have monthly meetings where they'll sit and go through with the board of directors and the management team kind of, you know, a debrief of how things have been going. You're watching The Language of Business. I'm Greg Stoller, and my guest is John Murphy, an associate at a leading early stage venture capital firm. So do you set metrics for the individual executives, and then how do you interpret those results? By way of explanation, is the president, the CEO, evaluated differently than, as you said, the CTO or the vice president of marketing, et cetera? Yeah, I don't think there's any you know, specific metrics that we look at, um, but it's more just execution and how they've been. You know, Obviously, the CEO has a different role than the CTO versus the head of sales and marketing. Um, so I, I do think each individual executive has a different kind of scope that they're looked at under. Um, if the technology is struggling, but they're seeming to have really good traction with customers, we're going to look at the CTO or the VP of engineering, as opposed to there's a great technology, it's really well built, it's you know working great, but they can't seem to get it out to the market. We're going to look more to the sales executives and the CEO. Okay. And when you need to make changes, do you bring in professional management or simply replace existing talent on a one-for-one -one basis? Uh, it definitely depends. Um, so if the company has somebody that can step into that role, um, that's obviously the preferred thing is keeping something within the company. Um, but a lot of times that, you know, with early stage companies, there's only so many employees in the company. So um, we'll reach out to our network um, and also ask the management team to reach out to their network and the board to reach out to their network. And we'll find somebody that has, um, you know, significant experience in that area that can bring that to the table and, and help the company. So if the firm is struggling from a marketing perspective, are you inclined to meet with the vice president of marketing and his or her team one on one? Or do you tend to meet only with the CEO or the senior vice presidents and then have them dispense with their own team the guidance that you're giving? Yeah, I think it, it usually happens at the board level. So it's not really our place to be stepping in and, and managing the company. That's the CEO's job. Yeah. Um, so it's addressed at the board level. And you know, there's recommendations that are made to the CEO. But at the end of the day, it's the company that is responsible for you know, making those changes. For implementing those. And what you're saying is you could tell the CEO, we strongly believe that you should do x, y, and z. But ultimately, he or she might decide that a variant of that approach is appropriate. Right, exactly. Compared with other likely large employers you've worked with, for example, Grant Thornton, do you think the evaluation of the management team for a startup should be treated differently? Um, I, I think it, you know, it's the same general principles, but the way that it's done is different. Um, so I think at a larger company, it's usually a quarterly or annual review process. Um, in a startup, it's more ongoing because everything's more real time and, um, you know, any delays in the process uh, can really cause some issues for the business. Um, so I think it's more real time, it's more you know, regular, and it's communicated a lot more frequently than in maybe a larger corporation where you know, one individual person maybe isn't driving as much value for the company. So are you suggesting, without putting words in your mouth, that at a startup it's more by gut feel than whereas with larger employers it's more of an official institutionalized process? I mean, I would say it's a little bit of both. Um, you know, the board is definitely, at, at the board level, it's very well documented and it's, it's you know, ensured that it's not just a gut feeling that there's, you know, it's a bunch of people sitting around the board. It's definitely at the board level of a Grant Thornton company or at the board level of even a Point Judith Capital at, Investment? I would say at the board level of Point Judith Capital right. Investment. So do your board meetings tend to have an air of we're on the same team or at times do they get a little bit controversial if things aren't going as planned? Um, I think the goal is always to have the, the right. feeling of we're on the same team because that's really, you know, what drives value in the business. Um, but, you know, I think at times it does become, a, you know, there are issues that come up that need to be discussed and, um, you know, it does get a little bit um, adversarial at times, uh, but the goal is not to be adversarial for the sake of being adversarial. It's, the goal is to build the business. And, and you're not trying to knock the company out of the box. Even if it's exactly. one of 10 portfolio companies you've invested in, you're really trying to make sure that every ten, every one of the 10 are going to be successful, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. And, and it, it all comes back to hoping and you know, driving the business to be successful. Right. Um, so if there's you know a change that needs to be made on the management level, then it gets brought up at the, at the board meetings. But um, at, at the end of the day, it's not just because we're venture capitalists and we want right, to come course, in and change right, the management right. team. It's because we're really trying to drive the, you know, the largest business possible and the well, most value. Well, thanks, John. John Murphy from Point Judith Capital. 
But what happens when you have an existing successful company that's trying to embrace new initiatives? Or a firm that's trying to react to wholesale changes in federal or state legislation, which has immediately affected their operations and profitability? We'll find out next on The Language of Business. Seven thousand students drop out every school day. That's a line of desks more than four miles long. Keep students in school. Visit BoostUp.org and take the first step. Alexandra Devaca has thirty-five years of human resources experience in publishing and in healthcare. In her current role as Chief Administrative Officer at Hebrew Senior Life the largest provider of elder care in the Boston metropolitan area. She not only oversees a large staff internally, but also nearly 75 volunteers. Alexandra, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. So what are the biggest challenges you've noticed in healthcare over your 15-year tenure in the industry? I would say that the industry has been faced with quite a few challenges and changes. If I were to categorize the biggest three or four, I would say the first is definitely a variety of changes in sort of the regulatory environment. You know, it feels like every day we get a new set of regs that we need to comply with. That coupled with um, the need for additional transparency about quality of care in the healthcare industry, you know, cu customers want to know. Are they getting the best care possible? And we have to report and um, you know publish data about different um, metrics that we keep track of in healthcare. And how are you defining your customers? Are these going to be residents? Patients and residents. Patients and residents. Right. Okay. The other changes I would say that have occurred is you know technology has had a huge impact on how care is delivered, the roles that healthcare workers play, the job descriptions that they have. The way we're reimbursed and paid for our services has changed dramatically. Dramatically, yes, <laughs> yes. sure. So, so um, that's a big change. And then the other thing I would say is there's a variety of labor challenges and shortages, whether it was the nursing shortage you know, that we heard about 10 years ago. Now there's no primary care physicians and sure. geriatricians, which are you know, very important to us. So if you look at this holistically, how much of this has been voluntary change as opposed to change mandated by federal or state legislation? It's probably a 60-40 split. I mean, uh, obviously. 60 on what side? 60 mandated change, 40, and 40 voluntary. voluntary. Right. You know, technology is not something that was mandated, nor were sure. labor shortages, but certainly the regulatory environment, payment, and reimbursement changes were definitely imposed by state or federal and has governments. Has technology been a net positive or a net negative for your company? I would say definitely a net positive, um, but it requires a lot of change in the workflow of um, the environment and people getting, like doctors and nurses getting, and even you know CNAs, et cetera, getting used to using technology. So the initial- um, and, I, and I assume this is well beyond the electronic medical record that it's-, it's right. uh, The electronic medical record is a big part of that. Um, you know, that means that doctors have to do their business definitely. They're productivity is tracked, they have, the quality of metrics are tracked, things that they were not accustomed to in the past. And that holds true for all of the clinical staff. So I think that getting used to using technology and to then maximize sort of their productivity and while very importantly keeping the quality <laughs> of care up um, is, is really a new way of doing things yeah, for I'm many sure. people. It's a completely new, new it's dynamic. very yeah. new. So I know that you have over 2,000 employees. Mm -hmm. How do you evaluate their success from the executive level all the way down? Not the same way. Of <laughs> so, so, really? Yeah. <laughs> so we have uh, we broadly group employees into what we call job families. So, okay. for example, the uh, you know cooks and housekeepers and engineers and maintenance folks might be one job family, and then there's sort of a senior management team that's another. There's a group of clinicians. So we have different sort of approaches and criteria for the different job families that exist within the organization. Holistically, I would say that there's some technical criteria, and then there's some sort of softer skills that we assess. So how much of it is qualitative, how much of it is quantitative, or some combination? Um, I would say at a frontline level, it's more quantitative and some qualitative. Um, you know, customer service or ability to work as part of a team are definitely qualities that we look for, whether you're a housekeeper or whether you're sure. the CEO. Right. Um, but it gets less and less sort of quantitative um, and harder to pin down quantitatively the more senior you are in the organization. So, And what sort of metrics do you use for senior members of the organization? 
so for the senior management team, which in our case is about 60 people, right. um, there's sort of three components to how we assess our managers and leaders. There's some technical skills that we look for. So everybody has to be able to put, for example, together a budget and have financial management right. skills and read a P&L and those kinds of things. Then there's another bucket that is associated with goals that we've established for the organization. So about two to three years ago, the organization, the executive leadership team, and eventually the senior leadership team got together and established a set of five goals. Then each one of us, based on those five goals, has a set of annual or year or two goals that we have to achieve as part of our performance and responsibility. So, you know, the marketing person has to make sure that they keep occupancy at a certain sure. level or something like that. Um, so that's one bucket of uh, how we're assessed is in addition to the technical skill is how well we did in achieving the particular goals that were set out. These goals, by the way, are reviewed by the CEO and our board on yep. an annual basis. And then there's sort of the third bucket, which is, in my opinion, the hardest to pin down and um, the softest, which is uh, leadership abilities and skills. So we've done quite a bit of work in the last two to three years on sort of setting expectations what Hebrew senior, on what Hebrew Senior Life expects for their leaders and from their leaders. So we look in for leaders, things like modeling the way, challenging sort of current processes. And you know, staying and as innovative as you Staying as innovative right. as you can. Leading from the heart is very important for us. So in the sort of part of our appraisal where we assess those types of criteria, um, it's a little less you know, quantitative and, and more, more the soft qualitative. And more skills that you, were, that you were talking mm -hmm. to before. You're watching The Language of Business. I'm Greg Stoller, and we're talking with Alessandra DeVaca, a chief administrative officer. She spends a lot of time thinking how to innovate the human resources function. So our first guest, John Murphy, indicated the approach to evaluating talent at a startup is different than what's used at an established company. Where do you come out in this question? I think there's some overlap and there's some differences. So I How so? So I think qualities of great leaders are the same irregardless of what industry you're in. So for example, we do a two-day management development program for all of our managers at the organization. And we talk about five leaders. We talk about Nelson Mandela, Bill Belichick, Steve Jobs, and um, a few other, you know, Mother Teresa. Right. <laughs> and, so, and there are some qualities that all of those leaders have, certainly challenging the way that uh, the right. current and processes. Right, which are going to go across industries right. and everything else. So right. I think that that um, those things are probably somewhat similar, although the emphasis on how much you need of particular skills may be different in a startup environment than it is in, a, in an established organization like ours. But yet, Hebrew Senior Life, by all accounts, is regarded as an innovative employer. Mm -hmm. This would indicate that some of your new initiatives might feel like entrepreneurship or internal entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Does this mean you'll be changing the evaluation metrics you'll be using moving forward? I think that we will for some people or some groups of people, for sure. And we've already seen some of that in the last couple of years as we made some pretty significant changes in the organization. So we opened a new campus, by example, a few years ago. And where was that? In Dedham. Yep. Um, and the way we deliver health care on the campus is quite different than how we do it at sort of our flagship in Roslindale. So the way those employees assess some of that criteria has definitely changed as we try to spurn further growth and change and challenging the processes that we have in place, we definitely, for certain people, put more emphasis on those criteria than others. So how do you change an established employee base? Because new employees, obviously, by default, aren't uh -huh. going to be jaded by what they might have been experiencing at the organization. Uh -huh. How do you take your established employee base and get them to think more entrepreneurially at all levels? First of all, you have to model the way. So you have to tell people and set the expectation that we want you to challenge the current processes, you know, in a reasonable way. Of course, right. right. <laughs> so, um, and you have to appreciate and reward those that do. And I actually think that Is that you, just financially or those through other rewards as I well? I think actually in healthcare, we don't have a lot of options to reward financially beyond certain sort of certain expectations. Um, I think that we need to, it's just saying thank you, it's rewarding people in different ways, you know, um, whether it's publicly or, you know, right. giving them some appreciation awards, those kinds of things. But I think even more importantly, you have to not reprimand people who try something new and fail at it. So, because if you do that, the person sitting next to them is it's never going to try anything new. They're going to try so, anything new at all. They're going to so, say, look what happened to that person. Right. right. I think that's one of the most important things you have to do is, and you have to set the expectation that it's okay to challenge the process. We want you to. And there are people that know how to do that and people that are nervous about that. And um, I think when we talk about the criteria of what 
we look for in leaders at Hebrew Senior Life. We don't want the kinds of leaders in particular roles that aren't willing to let their employees sort of, you know, push the boundaries a little bit. I think it's wonderful that you guys want to treat your employees from both the executive level all the way down to the staff level in that innovative fashion. Thank you. That was great. Not surprisingly, startups and established companies have different approaches to developing and evaluating their management team and overall employee base. But what happens in the trenches themselves? Our next guest is neither a financier nor a management team officer, but rather a serial entrepreneur in the midst of building his latest company. Does he have time to sit down and evaluate talent, or doesn't he have a choice? Matthew Bellows is coming up next on Language of Business. Because while many doors open, these doors transform. They did for us. Support your local boys and girls clubs. Great futures start here. With specialties in sales, product development, startups, fundraising, and as he puts it, quote unquote, doing whatever it takes, great line, Matthew Bellows is my next guest. He has over 20 years of work experience, much of which has been spent developing companies or advising them. He's the founder and CEO of Yesware, which finds out who opens your emails and clicks on your links. It's new, unique technology meant to provide real-time feedback for salespeople. Matthew, welcome to the Language of Business. Thanks, Greg. I think your products are terrific, but do you ever get any pushback from people concerned, their email reading habits and click-through history are analyzed? It's very rare. Uh, we have about 200,000 customers. So uh, given that size, we have very few complaints, but we take them all very seriously. We take security and privacy issues uh, to the heart of the company. Can anybody ever shut this off? Yeah. Receivers have control over whether or not uh, they receive these emails and whether or not they receive the tracking portion of them. And how long does it take for a salesperson to install this and turn it on? Uh, it takes about 15 seconds. You can do it yourself at yesware.com. Excellent. And how is Yesware different from traditional CRM systems like Salesforce? Uh, Yesware integrates in with Gmail and actually helps a salesperson do their job better. So we try to help salespeople make more money and close more deals. Traditional CRM systems are much more for the management to see what's going on in the systems. Um, we take the approach of helping the salesperson and aggregating their data back into the CRM. And I assume that you can piggyback onto Gmail even if you have a proprietary or private email account. Yes, exactly. Yeah, Gmail or Google Apps accounts. So the idea being that it would be seamless to whoever is reading those emails in terms of sending out a sales flyer or something of that ilk. Yeah, so the emails that Yesware helps you with come from your account, from your business account or your personal account. Uh, generally, your company account that's hosted by Google or uses Outlook 2013. So the idea being that if you were announcing version number two of a new software product, you would send that out to 500 of your potential customers, and you could very quickly find out how many of them opened the email, how many of them went to click through the attachments or stuff uh, so, like that. So right? that's a traditional marketing email service that lots of companies, HubSpot and Constant Contact in the area, and also uh, you know well, lots of other marketing services right. provide. We focus much more on the one-to-one -one community communication between the salesperson and the prospect or the salesperson and the customer. We're less concerned with big email blasts and much more focused on the one-to-one -one relationship. So, and what would be an example of the one-to-one -one relationship? So let's say your company sends out a proposal, uh, uh, an announcement of a new feature. Right. Then you, the salesperson, get the email back. Then you want to send me a note to say, hey, are you interested in this? Here's how it could work, a proposal about how my particular company could use your software. We have a relationship. I write you back, you write me back. I ask you a question, you would give me the answer quickly, et cetera. Makes perfect sense. So I know Yesware is not only your third startup, but also one that features a similar founding team. Is that because success breeds success? Well, partly, I think, I hope that's true anyway. Right. <laughs> uh, but, but that's really because, uh, you know, Cashman and I have been through the startup ringer together. This is Cashman Andrus. Cashman Andrus is uh, co-founder and CTO yep. of Yesware. And we started a business back in 2001 called uh, Wireless Gaming Review. And we sold that business to CNET in 2004. So having been through that bootstrap, get going, hire people, sell a company together, 
we kind of knew we could trust each other to do another one. But I guess that begs the question, should you be introducing new blood into the founding team so that having too much familiarity is not potentially jading you? We actually did introduce a third co-founder at the start of the business called uh, a gentleman named Rajat Bhargavat. And he is a serial entrepreneur, went to MIT and started several businesses here, and has been really helpful in terms of scaling our business. And is also providing a fresh perspective for you and Cashman. Exactly. And then I got to say, the management team that has joined Yesware since uh, also keeps us on our toes. But after all of these years of working together, how do you evaluate one another? The process of evaluating co-founders and management team at a startup, as you've said in the previous episodes, is uh, really more ad hoc and more real time than at a bigger company where there's review cycles and paperwork to fill out. It's much more of a sense of how's it working right now? How did it work yesterday? In the here and now. How did it work? How's it going to work next week? Um, because the time frames are so compressed. So. The thing about this founding team, and particularly the management team we've built up uh, recently, is that we all are pushing each other to be better. And that is, in effect, the sort of uh, drive that makes us all improve. So are you able to ask each other to change your work habits? Or with three founders, is it so small that, frankly, replacing one of them, even buying them out, might be a more effective option? Um, that, would be, that would be the last resort. Um, and I think with the founding team and with the management team we've got assembled, that's not really the approach. The approach is really like, how do we help each other get better? So we're just starting a formal 360 degree review process uh, where we use outside software to gather feedback about each other. And we're always trying to encourage each other to be better as opposed to sort of slot people in and out. But if it's 360 degrees, who's above you? You board? Yeah. I have uh, board members, customers, and advisors. Uh, sort of from the outside of the company, and then executives and individual contributors who are reviewing me from below. You're watching The Language of Business. I'm Greg Stoller, and we're talking with Matthew Bellows, who is a serial entrepreneur and one with a similar founding team. So let's transition to personnel in the lower level functions. How does the evaluation process work for them? Is it still ad hoc, to borrow a phrase from you, or is it more institutionalized? We're only 25 people. And uh, at the end of last year, we were 18. Right. So we're small, growing quickly. There, there actually are very few lower levels. In fact, I would say it's a pretty flat organization. We're all structure. one right. team. Yeah. Uh, of 25 trying to get this done, and so at the moment, we don't need organizational structure, particularly or formal review processes. Um, I'm just starting the 360-degree review process just to experiment right. on myself. See how it works. See how it right. works. Right. But for everyone on the team, it's really. Uh, are you doing your work? Is it happening? And do ever, does everyone else feel like you're contributing as much as you can? And we, we have a very loose oversight. So for example, we have no vacation policy. Our vacation policy is take as many days as you need. And the flip side of that is that the team is figuring out, is this person contributing their weight or not? Right. And are they overdoing it? Are they abusing the privilege? Yes. Or are they, are they following and, the and, and right, we, startup line, supposed to the company line? Yeah, right. exactly. And we, we do fire people. So when things aren't working out, we definitely let people go. But it's much more of a group process. So in both good times and bad, how much do you communicate to the entire 18 or now 25 people, frankly, what's happening in the company? I am as open as I can possibly be. <laughs> about what's going on in the company. I mean, I, I... So if you're worried about funding not coming through in round X, subsequent round X, or you yep. got a particularly good piece of feedback or yep. bad piece of feedback about the latest yep. iteration of the software, you're basically an open book? I basically share all of that stuff. Um, people figure it out anyway, and I really hope that everybody knows what's going on, which reduces all kinds of internal... Strife. Right. Strife, <laughs> gossip, you know, resentment, confusion. And so by being as open as I can about how the board meeting went yesterday, we, uh, how the customer meeting went, what the you know, advisor said to me yesterday, then that encourages everyone else to be open so there's much better sharing of information. I sincerely wish you guys the best of luck. Thanks, Greg. Matthew Bellows. In this episode, we looked at the different approaches to assembling, retaining, and evaluating a company's personnel, both at the startup and also at the established company level. Next time on The Language of Business, we'll look at building a strong sales team still in the organizational section of the business plan.
I'm Greg Stoller, and thank you for watching The Language of Business. If you have a business in need of consulting assistance, or are an entrepreneur looking to develop a business plan, we may be able to help. Contact me, Greg Stoller, via email or through Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. I look forward to hearing from you.